leading us in those great hymns and in that particular expression, the Apostles' Creed. We're going to do things a little differently today. We have been uh, in recent history uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper in the middle of the service. And then after that, coming with a scripture exhortation uh, and, the, and the reading of our covenant uh, in the aftermath of that. Today, because we're working through the material in 1 Corinthians 11 on the Lord's Supper, and we looked at the first part of that last Sunday, today we're going to look at the last of the three points made there. And in the aftermath of that, then we will come to the Lord's table, celebrate the Lord's Supper, and then read our covenant together. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 17 to 34, the entire section there, even though we took up last week all the way through verse 26. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. Stand with me if you would. Hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible with you or don't have a Bible, we're going to have it on the screen for you. I was talking to someone the other day. It's important that we engage as many of our senses as possible when we read the scriptures. So I hope that you participate. When we read responsively here every service, I hope you participate because what you're doing then is you are you're seeing it, you're hearing it, you're saying it. It's more likely to be yours. Here we have it on the screen because I want you to see it if you, don't have, if you can't gaze upon it in your own copy of the scripture. And I want you to hear it as I read. So follow along as I read these verses. Beginning at verse 17. But in the following instructions I do not commend you because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place when you come together as a church I hear that there are divisions among you and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord... What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. And the other things I will give directions when I come. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And all we need this teaching. We need this teaching. Jesus Christ, death on the cross, leveled anything that could separate any human being from another human being if both of those human beings would repent of sin and confess faith in Jesus Christ. They would by virtue of the cross, by the grace of God, become one. Corinth was not acting like one. And Paul had a controversy with them about that concerning the Lord's Supper. Thank you. Please be seated. 
Well, we told you last week that when you look at this passage, verses 17 through 34, it falls out into three uh, areas. First is he addresses what he, the abuse of the supper. I said last week it's a pretty condemning thing. And think about how it must have felt for Paul. Paul founded the church at Corinth. It's a pretty condemning thing for the person who poured his life into the founding of the church to say, when you come together, you are worse off than before you came together. That's totally contrary to the nature of the church gathered around the cross of Christ. And yet Paul has that level of concern about the church at Corinth. He get, then goes on to talk about the meaning and significance of the Lord's Supper in verses 23 to 26 as he lays out what happened uh, that night. And today we look at the manner in which the Lord's Supper should be taken, verses 27 to 34. We just read that passage. It teaches us that we should prepare our hearts to come to this table. When you study it, you realize the only people who are welcome to the Lord's table are those who have repented of sin, trusted in Jesus Christ. It doesn't say this in the passage, but when you put the, the corpus of the Scripture together, the witness of Scripture, such a person should follow the Lord Jesus in believer's baptism by immersion. And then should be walking in vital unity in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He or she should be striving to promote and guard and protect the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The problem at Corinth is division. The problem at Corinth is selfishness. Corinth is a church that is not acting like a church should act if they've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So Paul addresses the manner in which this supper should be taken. The Lord's Supper, remember, is simply the, it's a, it's a genitive of possession, the supper of the Lord. It belongs to him. He instituted it. We don't get to monkey with it. We're to present it and follow his instructions in it or be found unfaithful to him. In this manner, he says again, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. You can approach this unworthily today. You shouldn't. I pray that as we're studying through this today that your heart will take time to make proper preparation to repent where you need to repent to God for attitudes unbecoming a person who would celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and by doing so say, I'm a participant in this. I've been saved by that historical reality represented here in the symbol. I hope you use opportunity to examine your own heart. Paul calls for that. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, the body, the church, the local expression that you're a part of, to come to this without regard for the body, which is his charge that he gives earlier in the, in the text, to come to this without thinking about self-denial, without thinking better of others, more highly of others, esteeming, recognizing God's gifts and graces here, That person, listen, eats and drinks judgment on himself. It seems impossible that a memorial, an ordinance left by Jesus Christ to be participated in in remembrance of him could be an occasion for someone to bring temporal judgment upon themselves. But that's exactly what the apostle says. And then he says something in verse 30 that's shocking. That is why many of you are weak and ill. And some have died. In the church at Corinth, Paul is telling us something. And, and think about when they lived in the first century, the middle of the first century is when he writes this. They, had, they didn't have an abundance of hospitals to go to. If they had sick people among them, they had to use remedies known caring for one another, weakness, illness, 
and then people dying because they approached what should be a celebration of the Lord's Supper with a heart and in a manner that was unbecoming a follower of Jesus Christ. So he gives this exhortation. If we judged ourselves truly, in other words, if we would take the occasion to examine ourselves, we would not be judged. We would not come under the temporal judgment that those in Corinth were experiencing. Weaknesses, illnesses, death. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So let's, he says, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for another. Remember I told you last week that, that in the early New Testament period, they mixed a meal. If you could imagine, it would be like our going to have our fellowship meal in the fellowship hall after the service. And then in the middle of that, to stop, or maybe on the tail end of that, to, to then move to focusing in on, on bread, and the fruit of the vine as the memorial to Jesus. Paul chides them in the earlier verses because he says, some of you come, and, and in the picture we gave you last week, that there were people in the Corinthian church who did not have. They, they didn't have the wherewithal that when the church gathered. And it's believed that in the early church, they gathered weekly, participating weekly in this. Some churches still do that today. So every week they would have a meal, and in the middle of that meal they would have a recognition of the supper of the Lord, the memorial to Jesus. And some would bring their food, and some didn't have any food. And rather than doing what the Spirit of Christ would lead you to do, that is to share, they would hoard, they would withhold. And they would eat, and gorge themselves while others stood by with nothing to eat and simply watched. And they would get carried away. And Paul says, some of you are getting drunk. And he chides them. He says, put the emphasis where this emphasis ought to be when you gather in the name of the Lord. You can eat at home. You can come together as the body of Christ, however. Deny yourself. Think more highly of others. Be sure that those who don't have, have the opportunity to share. It had to be an ugly scene. It was certainly not provoke, promoting the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It was not something attractive so that those from the Corinthian culture who might venture into the midst of the, of the church would be captivated by the love. This is one of the commentaries that, that external biblical material noted about the early church. Behold how they love one another. Paul says, you're not loving one another in Corinth. So let's look at this. We cannot, must not come to this table with a factious spirit, that is, with, a, with an enmity, a hostility, Paul began this letter chatting them, scolding them because they were following different preachers. They were romanticizing. Oh, I sure wish brother so-and-so was still here. Paul said, That's, there's nothing edifying about that because you're mocking God about the gifts he's given you. And so that's contentious party spirit, that schismatic attitude. That's one of the words used here in the Greek in this text is the word schism. Because it must not be. These preachers you adore, they didn't die for you. Jesus died for you. And he died to make you one. And so he chides their factiousness, their gluttony, their, the things that manifest themselves in this supper that are totally contradictory to the Spirit of Christ. It would be humorous, but not humorous, if when we passed these elements in a few moments, and passed by with the, with the little tray of the little square pieces of unleavened bread, if someone just took their hand and went, shh, and scooped all of it into their hand. Paul says, think of others. Think of others. 
Selflessness must yield to selfishness. Thoughtfulness must thoughtlessness. Let me back that up. Selfishness must yield to selflessness. And thoughtlessness must yield to thoughtfulness. And self denial must lead the way. So he says, when you come together, think of others. The same Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 22, after that marvelous passage in 8, 9, and 10, by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on two good works that the Lord has before ordained that we should walk in them. He goes on to say in verse 14, for he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now if you know the context here, in the Ephesian culture he's talking about how Jew and Gentile were hostile toward one another. And the gospel comes. And the cross is made powerful. So that the hostility that exi existed between Jew and non-Jew is gone with both that Jewish person and that non-Jewish person come to kneel at the cross, come to repent of sin and trust in Christ, that the, their barriers are abolished. Listen to this. By abolishing the law of commandments con expressed in ordinances, that is the ceremonial law, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. The hallmark of the gospel is peace. The Prince of Peace comes to make peace between unreconciled sinners and an angry God. He offers himself. We sang about it, Man of Sorrows. Wonderful song that portrays how Jesus stood in our place and the, the sin of man was on him and the wrath of God was on him because of sin. And he satisfied divine justice by his suffering and dying in our place. Creating himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Do you have hostility today toward another believer? Something's wrong. The cross killed that. Killed it. If it's living in you, Something's wrong. You need to take the power of the cross of Christ and put that to death as you examine yourself in anticipation of coming to the table. And he came, verse 17, and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. The near, the Jews, the far off, the Gentiles. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father when you pray. You're praying to the same Father that every believer is praying to. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens. This is specifically to people like us, non-Jews. No longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We've been made members, a family. We're one family here. When the world looks upon a church and sees a fuss and fight and family, it's a practical denial of the cross of Jesus Christ. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, that is the, the, the word of God, Old and New Testament, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He's the one, that, that chief stone that lays out everything square. See, if we're, not, if we're not squared on Jesus, we're not square. Doesn't matter how we think our doctrine is. If we're not loving out of the overflow of the love of Jesus for us, then we're not square. Jesus is the cornerstone. All of what we believe, all of who we are, should be squared to him. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's sanctification. Are you becoming more like Jesus Christ? 
A husband and wife that fuss and fight with one another on the way to church are a contradiction and a stumbling block to children seeing them do it. We're to show people, those we love, those who don't love us, that the gospel makes a difference. The gospel changes everything. It changes our attitudes. So he calls upon the Corinthians to examine themselves. Ask the self, here's the question, am I living, am I acting and living in love and charity toward my neighbor? We're going to be getting into 1 Corinthians 12 in the near future. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. The unity aspect. In Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Over all and in all. So to come to the supper of the Lord. To partake of it when it's passed in a moment. By taking it, you're not only saying, I belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to me. You're saying, I belong to these brothers and sisters here. That's why we read our covenant. We've covenanted together. Are you a covenant keeper or a covenant breaker? Read the covenant discerningly when we read it momentarily. Is my embrace of this biblical document, because it's biblically saturated with biblical principles and texts, am I provoking my brothers and sisters to love and good works or am I a stumbling block? We've said this to you in years past. If every church member was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? You need to ask yourself that. He says people are weak there. They lose their strength. There's nothing magical about this supper. But to the extent that we... Jesus commanded us to do in obeying him, obedience to Christ flexes and grows the muscles of the follower of Christ. People are weak. Some are sick. They're in need of a doctor because you see they're not taking the cue taught by the apostle that the great physician Jesus Christ said, you will be this for me. And they're weak. But the tragedy is, Paul says some have died there. Brothers and sisters, I've seen it. I served in a church where two leaders, two key leaders, led an all-out assault on the ministry because of their desire for immorality. And I watched it as they defied admonition after admonition. They didn't believe in redemptive, corrective church discipline, though they tried to get me fired. That's also always fascinating when you see that. People who don't believe in discipline try to fire the preacher. They believe in some kind of discipline, clearly. And they got married anyway, never repenting of their adultery. They began to plan a trip she went to get a checkup. She died of cancer. Tragically. I know cancer gets a lot of people, and I wouldn't suggest that everybody who gets cancer is coming under the judgment of God, but you'll never convince me that this woman who was the picture of health did not face the judgment of God. I don't believe God does that. Well, interview Ananias and Sapphira and ask them about it. We need to take this seriously. We can't be superficial about these things, about unity, about guarding the body, about provoking one another to love and good works, because the Bible takes it seriously. He says you're being disciplined. If you would, if you would judge yourself, if you would examine yourself, if you would approach these things seriously, then you wouldn't come under the discipline of the Lord. And he's not talking about the, the condemning, sending to hell 
of the Lord. He does that to unbelievers. Dear people, you need to know this. John talks about in 1 John, there is a sin that leads to death. That some believers can provoke the Lord in such extreme ways. And John says, if you see someone sinning, a sin that does not lead to death, pray for him. I do not say that you should pray for one if he's lead, sinning a sin that leads to death. See, we don't talk about this. It's not pleasant. But it's true in the scriptures. And that's what Paul is saying is happening in Corinth. He says, what you're experiencing there is the discipline of the Lord. That he will, and I tremble because I know some people that I wonder if that's what's going to happen to them. He will take that person out of the earth rather than let that person live and that person's witness continue to trample underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he says something here that's cited in Hebrews 12, verses 5 and following. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. What was tragedy in Corinth? Biblical writers say is, is God's love for those who are his who go wayward on him when he takes them out and his love for the assembly, lest they think lightly of sin. He disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and as daughters. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The worst thing that can happen to anyone who professes to know Jesus is to continue on in sin, continue on making strife, continue on and not be disciplined for it because it says something about to whom you belong. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. So, it's a part and parcel of growing up in a home that you bring correction, instruction and correction. He says, but he, that is God, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. The, the discipline of the Lord, the temporal discipline is designed to provoke in us holiness, to, to make us hear and fear, to fear sin, to fear the holiness of God. And to purpose to repent and be conformed to his image. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. We will be carrying out in the near future redemptive, corrective church discipline on one of our members who has gone into scandalous sin. And it will not be because we're put out. It will not be to... Wipe our hands. It will be for the desire that redemptive, biblical, corrective discipline will spare the life of this person, provoke this person to repentance and recovery, and ultimately yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who, when coming under discipline, are trained by it. They learn from it. So Paul's, in closing, says instead of allowing the meal to become an example of selfish overeating, Christians should share their food and drink and give consideration to those who cannot contribute much food. We will do that, Lord willing, after this service in the Fellowship Hall. We'll think of others more highly than we do ourselves. It'll be a time of coming together for fellowship rather than selfish indulgence. There's no place I'd rather be on the first Sunday of the month when our service closes than with my brothers and sisters sharing a meal together. I have nothing more important to do. You see, 
the anticipation of that, we do the order reverse from what the New Testament did. Brings us here to this. Participation in the Lord's Supper is no trivial matter. It's a solemn privilege. It's not a right. To be undertaken by those who come in earnestness and commitment. It's a memorial to Christ. It's an anticipation of his return. You do show forth the Lord's death till he comes again. And it should be a source of much help and encouragement to the person who participates in the Lord's Supper. Be undertaken by a believer, only a believer, who's serious about his or her fellowship with God, who understands the nature of the cross, that there is the vertical relationship to God and the horizontal, horizontal relationship to one another. It's the loving God and loving others. And when we approach it right, we will have undertaken a, a rigorous self-examination and not approach it superficially. That's what Paul teaches about the Lord's Supper. Let's bow.